Greetings, friends, and thank you for being with us today on Our Daily Bread. Our Daily Bread is a talk show and a Bible discussion about the Word of the Living God, the King James Bible. Now, what a blessing it is today to have a wonderful group of people together, friends and um, associations and things in replays, and just a wonderful grouping of people that love God's Holy Word and the fact that we can count on God's Word. And that God is a real God, and He's not, He's not, um, He's not some high thinking or high concept or of some ascended master or or some type of, of fallible, unknowable, mysterious, and an unbelievable character, as many things are in in the uh, Hollywood world of Hollywood and movies and music industry and and um, esoteric type teachings and things of that nature. He's not like that. He's not. He's not dark and masked and unapproachable. And and he he's a lot different than people know him to be. Because frankly, they've been listening to what other people say about him, and they won't get uh, put forth the effort to try to find him yourself. You see, God is a personage. And you know we we get stumped on that because we're you know we're people and we're humans and and so you know our thinking and our logic is based primarily on a number of factors our experiences in life our education and our families and and what other people have said to you over the years about the subject and and so you you tend to form a generalized opinion based on multiple sounds of voices of multiple parties and input levels throughout your life and so at some point you know the light comes on and and, and you have some type of va vast understanding that is probably true but it's too hard to bring out the true nature of who God would be and so therefore you tend to miss him because your input level is um, is inadequate you know and many some people will speak to you about God but they don't know God so they're not qualified to talk about him because they don't know him and they had to study his book you know they just got a generalized opinion on what they heard and they want to share it with you and it doesn't uh, benefit you, and it doesn't bring you any closer. So let's talk today about the revealed knowledge of God, the Word of God, and what we know about God, and how great God is. Well, we'd like to start by explaining that, you see, God is a spirit, and you are a spirit. You are a spirit being. And they don't want to teach that today, because, you know, they... they they want to teach you that you're a soul and that you know you have a mind, will, intellect, and emotion. But you know it's all electric and it's all uh, based on you know what you what you teach your mind and that that um, the soul is doesn't affect the spirit realm and that that uh, the spiritual things in life is you know maybe good for the mystic or or maybe good for the psychic or or things like this, but you know, you as a regular person, that you're not gifted that way, or something of this nature, so that you know you miss then the truth of the spirit realm. But let's understand that God is a spirit, and you are a spirit. You live in a body, and you possess a soul. And when you accept Christ as your Savior, your spirit becomes alive unto God. Prior to that, you were uh, still a spirit, but you was dormant in the fact that you didn't have any conduit with the Spirit of God. But when you accept His Son through the blood of Christ and His work at Calvary and the resurrection, then that connection is made. And you become what the Scripture calls quickened. You are alive unto God. For the first time, you are able then to operate and access the spirit realm. So... As a born-again person and as a believer in Christ Jesus, then you're in touch with the spirit realm through the Savior and through the knowledge of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. And so then these parameters have to be 
added to in order to make your communication efficient between the spirit realm of God in heaven through the Holy Spirit and through the Word of God and through your own faculty to understand it with your soul and your spirit. God is a spirit. Now, let's explain pretty much why we know about or what we know about the Trinity. Perhaps that's a good starting place. You see, God is an infinite being, and we can't look on into his face. No man has ever seen God in the, in the form of the Father on his throne, because if you did, it would kill you, because a human can't, can't see that kind of power. It's just too powerful. We're talking about the source of all knowledge and all wisdom, knowledge of past, present, and future. All veritables, knowledge to make electromagnetism and lightning and thunder, and knowledge to send rain and to develop ecosystems and humans that are three parts spirit, soul, and body, and and interaction between the earth and the moon and the sun, and between the trees that breathe in carbon monoxide and put out oxygen and the human that breathes in oxygen and puts out carbon monoxide. So these systems working together in ecological terms and rivers and mountains and you know some of the greatest beauty beauty in the world is under the ocean when you you've seen footage of how that the, the sea kingdom under the world is so beautiful and glorious with all its various lively fish and things of colors and all kinds of beautiful uh, creation, coral reefs and things of this nature, schools of fish flying around, or pardon me, swimming around. So, you know, God is a glorious being, great power, power that creates the sun, and it runs for 6,000 plus years without depleting its energy, you know, power that maintains all the, the cosmos and the planets and, and their rotations and all the things that go on in the molecular and quantum physical basis. See, this is great, great power. And what he's done is he's chosen to reveal himself as much as he can to our human consciousness and our spirit. So we get this understanding through the complexity of his word, Old and New Testament. And so Having said that, then we understand that God has decided that the best way to reveal himself to us is in three personages, three different types of people, if you will. Those three parts making up the Trinity. The Father, and he's the rule maker. He's the shot caller. He is the rule uh, rules over his family, and and he tells his sons and daughters what to do, and they listen to him. And he, he, he runs his household. And you're a brother or sister in Christ to me, and then you're a, a fellow uh, brother and sister in the kingdom and the family of God. So you're in his family, and he's the father. And then we have our elder brother Jesus, and Jesus, he's the Word of God. So God said, "Let there be light." And Jesus went out and made the Son. He's the Word that goes out of God. And He's a personage. And He came to earth, of course, born of the Virgin uh, Mary, and died on the cross, and was raised on the third day. So this is God that come down to talk to us and take, teach us things. And so He's the He's your friend, and He's your counselor, and and He's He's the one that cares about you. He's a mediator. He talks between the Father. And you, he takes your side and listens to it, and he takes the Father's side and listens to that, and then he makes peace between us. So he's the mediator, and he's, and he's the Savior, and he's the Word. And we have his representation on earth, the King James Bible. That's him, he's the Word of God, and the King James Bible was inspired by God. And so his representation is our Bible. Okay, having said that, then the next party is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the, the divine nature of God. It, his, his qualities, his, he's, he's very gentlemanly, he's very soft-spoken, he's very 
humble. He's very meek, and he, he likes beauty and purity, and, and he's kind and tender toward people. He's brotherly, and he's, he's the teacher of us, and he teaches us, and he admonishes us. He, he warns us, and he encourages us when you're feeling down. He's the one that comes to you and says, you can do it, son. You're going to make it, daughter. Come, come on. Let's get up and try again. We can, we can get over this, this valley. We can get through this situation. He's the Holy Spirit, and He's the nature of God, the loving, kind, compassionate nature of God. And so these three parts actually being one, you know, just as we're one. We're three parts, but you, we're one person. And He's three parts, but He's one person. And this one person we know is God in general. Broke down to us in three different personages, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay. Having said that, then today we're talking then about the revealed knowledge that allows us to have fellowship and to be in his presence and to walk in communion with such a holy and righteous and just a great power in the universe. The, the power that sets the dynamics of the sun and tells the sun's solar storms when to operate for the interjection of plasma into the universe to benefit the electromagnetic fields in multiple, multiple parts of the, his galaxies. You see, God Almighty is very great. And he's not a fool. And he's not a nitwit. And he, he's very organized, very structured. And he's given us a book of knowledge. And it's revealed unto mankind on how that we go about accessing him and what the proper procedures is. Now today we've got a wonderful young man with us, Brother Lucas. And uh, I was cutting up with him about an ID that he used, which was King Lucas. And I just love that. Because he's a brilliant young man. He's got his whole life ahead of him and I see great things in him. And... Uh, so, but I had was cutting up with him about him being king over his kingdom. And um, I want you to know God's got a kingdom. And like all kings, God is, God is sovereign in his kingship. And so he rules over everything. And he is very organized and structured. And there's a hierarchy to him. You know, and so... We have to understand then what is known as the protocols. And without picking on my brother Lucas too bad, but see if Lucas was a real king, and, and I'm believing God he's going to be a real king in Christ Jesus. But if a real king, you have to have certain requirements to come into his presence. You, you can't just come into his court and say, hey, I'm over here, I want to talk to you right now, king. Because if you did, they would chop your head off. You know, because, you know, who are you to come into the king's court and tell it, the king anything, you know, more or less. And so you have to have a procedure and a protocol and an invitation to come into his presence. And then when you get there, you have to bow and you have to say, you know, you're, you're our king, you know, permission to speak, sir, or something like this, you know. But each king is different, but there's a, a set of dynamics that you have to go through. To address the king of a nation. Now, what would that be if we was trying to address the king of the universe, like God is? And so, you see, then there's a formula. And this formula comes from the revealed knowledge of his holy word. And so, today we're going to talk about being in his presence. And what the knowledge of God, the revealed knowledge of God, will do for you if you'll take time to apply it to your life. And so we'd like to take just a moment and say a prayer real quick, and then we'll get started. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for your promises and your word. And I thank you for my friend Lucas and my brother J.D. and my brother, uh, Sister Karen, and also uh, Lucas, I believe, is a good-hearted brother in Christ Jesus, Lord God. I pray you'll pour out your spirit and your word upon this young man, that you'll bless his life and lead him and guide him into the things you have for him. And it's my prayer, Lord, that you help me to get out of the way and speak as the oracle of God and be used to by the God by the Spirit of God to teach your word holy and without error, and that the Lord God would raise me up 
to uh, this study and use me to glorify your holy word. name I pray. Amen. Glory to God. Well, it's a beautiful topic and we're going to start by something that you've probably heard before. I'm not sure exactly. It's Proverbs chapter 18 verse 24. And it says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And so we understand that pretty much. That works with us in the world today. If I want to be friends with Lucas, i got to be friendly with Lucas. If I want to be friends with Karen or Brother J.D., i got to be friendly. Because, you know, you have to be friendly in order to have friends. Okay. But then the second part of the verse is what I want us to look at mainly. It says, And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Now who do you suppose that would be? The friend that sticks closer than a brother, that knows you better than anybody. Well, that would be Jesus. Another verse says that a th strand of three cords are not easily broken. And so God is depicted in that verse as a cord, a rope of three strands. You know, you see a rope and it's, it's um, twined together, uh, plaited together. And it's three different uh, pieces of rope that has been uh, plaited together like you plait a lady's hair. You know, okay. And so that's three strands. And he says that a rope of three strands is not easily broken. So this would be the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in the, in the depiction of a rope that drops down from heaven and is, has, his, has itself tied to you and is not easily broken because God loves you and he wants you to succeed in life. In this verse, though, we see that God is a friend of yours and that he sticks closer to you than a brother. And I've noticed this about him over the years and, and I don't mean no harm and I'm not trying to be presumptuous, but... I've noticed over the years that God knows me better than I know myself. You know, because every now and then just something wonderful will happen, you know, and I will marvel at it. And I'll think, Lord, only you could have done figured on that because I didn't even know how much that would be cool. And so you did it for me because you did wanted to do something for me. Because he knew me better than I knew myself, you know. He, he knew what kind of car I wanted at one, one time. And I got that car. And and uh, it was four or five years before I got the car. But I had seen it at a car lot, the one similar to it. And uh, and I couldn't get it financed because I was young. I was about 16, actually. But four or five years later, there's that car sitting in my yard. And that God got it financed. And there it is. And, and it's beautiful. And, only, and I'd forgotten about it. But the Lord had remembered that I wanted that particular car. And it was awesome, you know. And he'll do that for Brother Lucas. He's ahead of us. And he's a friend to us. And now back to what we was talking about. You see, we're talking about the creator of this universe who has a longing to be your friend. What you need to do is to be friendly to him. And to take him at his word and to love his son that paid the price for us to be actually able to be his friend. And then he wants us to be in his presence. You know, like your, your friend wants you to be around, you know. He has a barbecue and he calls you up and he, he says, hey, I got some hamburgers over on this grill and... Uh, I got more than enough, and so how about coming over and having hamburgers with us this afternoon about 4 o'clock? I sound good, you know? Why is he doing that? Because he wants to be nice? Because he wants to give away the food to keep from wasting it? Um, because he wants to show off? No. He wants you in his presence. He wants to hang out with you and have fun with you and cut up about old times. You see? He's your friend. And your friend, he won't lie on you. And he won't make up stories on you. And he won't, you know, he's a real friend. And today that word friend is is greatly misunderstood because today almost anything, you know, passes for friendship. But friend, real friendship is friendship. You know, 
Uh, you know, and do we have what known as fair weather friends. So as long as you got money in your pocket and you've got gas in the, uh, your fuel tank, and as long as you're willing to ride them to the store and buy them something and uh, pat them on the back and, and everything is fair and good and there's no problems or anything, then, oh, you my friend, you let the blue lights on come on because you're speeding a little bit and <laughs> when the policeman gets to the window, then that friend's willing to say anything against you because he don't want to get in trouble and he'll ro he'll roll on you or try to trip you up or embarrass you with a policeman perhaps or something because you know it's a fair weather friend as long as everything's good then then good you're my friend but when something goes wrong then that's a fair weather friend that'll turn his back on you stab you in the back and take advantage of your friendship and what he knows about you he'll try everything to cover himself he'll roll on you then he wasn't a friend to start with so how do you measure friendship anymore well, you friend, measure friendship by picking good friends, people that really are true individuals, and that people that know the Bible and go by the Bible, and people you can have confidence in, and they give you reason to have confidence in you. But, see, God wants to be our ultimate friend, and he wants you to come into his presence and to commune with him, and he wants you to be a son or a daughter of his even us adults, you know, and and uh, Brother Lucas is an adult now. He's reached the adult age, and so we're all adults here. But you see, he wants you to be his son or daughter, even though we're grown people, you know. We might be mature adults, but compared to him, we don't know anything, you know. He knows everything. We know very little, you know. And so... Uh, he's greater than we, and he's he's the head of the family, and he gets to set the rules on how the relationship in the family works, and and we have to say, oh, okay, well the father said this, so I got to do this way, because the father said it. And so we got to listen to the father, and let him lead and guide us into his uh, his way of doing things. We got to remember that he's the great king. And so we can't deny his power and his greatness in the world. And so we have to obey his rules for approaching him, you know. And so this then becomes the basis for today's study about the revealed knowledge of God. Because the Word of God tells us how to work with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and how to interact in the things of God and how to approach God and how to live our lives and what he expects out of us and what we can expect out of him. And you know, the scripture is, we've heard me say this before, but it's worth repeating again, is that the, the modern day promised land is the Bible because God works by promises and it's by promises that he he deals with mankind and so he told Abraham the patriarch that if you would go and walk this land from the east to the west to the north and the south that wherever the soles of your feet shall trod you shall possess it for a possession and then he so he gave it to him by promise if he and he wanted him to walk through it and he'd get it then he said look to the east and the west and the north and the south and as far as the eye can see it will be yours so as far as he could look, he was going to see it, and, and that would be his if he could see it. So then, in the spiritual terms, the scripture now, Old and New Testament, is the promised land. And wherever the soles of your feet shall tread, you can possess it as a possession. So a promise in God's book is yours. And he's a God that works promises. And so as far as the eye can see, the east and west and north and south and within your Bible, you can possess it as a possession. So then this revealed knowledge then of God as given to us by the Texas Receptus, the King James Bible, the majority text, is very quintessential to understanding then the mode of the spirit and the way that the spirit realm works and the dynamics of it, you know. And you think about quantum mechanics, or perhaps um, 
the molecular biology, microbiology, you know. And um, they say they got a camera now that can look down into a cell deeper than it's ever been before. And they can see within the blood cell motors like engines, if you would, electric engines, little finite little engines and switches and relays and pumps and all kinds of uh, teeming with life, mechanical things that are biological in nature, but yet they're in soup they're in, in uh, they're in within a drop of blood. And so that's how brilliant God is in his design. And so there's engineering in his in, in a blood cell. And so with all this engineering and things then we see the need to understand that God is far greater than man gives him credit for. And that it's imperative that we take the knowledge and learn to properly apply that knowledge so that the intricacies and the dynamics of his revealed pattern for operating within his fellowship and friendship and relationship can be established and can grow. And that comes from the Bible, from revealed knowledge. So then this book then becomes our policy manual. And, it, you know, there's the old joke about this. It's, you know, the word Bible, you've heard it. Uh, well, it's a Latin book, a word, by the way. It means library. And so this is God's library. But there's an advantage. It goes that the Bible stands for, it's an acronym, and it stands for Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. And so and that's pretty much true. This is your companion guide. You know, if you buy a car, brand new, and you get the keys from the dealer and he says, okay, it's yours. Well, you go and get in the car and you open the dash and there is the owner's manual written by the manufacturer. And the manufacturer knows all about this car. It knows how many gallons goes in the radiator and it knows how many quarts of oil you need and it knows when the clutch is going to be serviced and it knows uh, how to set the thermostat on the air condition. It knows everything about this car because it's the policy, ma the service manual and the instruction manual for this car. Well, this is your instruction manual for a human. Yeah, this is the human instruction manu manual written by the manufacturer, the good Lord. And we see that. And it says in Timothy, all scriptures given by God is profitable for re correction and for reproof and for instruction in righteousness. So the word of God is, um, is basic to our lives. We have to have this instruction manual. And this instruction manual is very important that we follow it and learn to operate within it. Now, what if you took that car that you bought that's brand new and you... Um, tried to go forward by putting the gear shifter in the reverse position <laughs> well you'd go in the reverse and you wouldn't go forward and you'd hit something and crash the car why because you didn't follow the instruction manual you know and so you see I know it's a simple example but that's the way people are trying to live is, is we're trying to live without the instruction manual you know and um and that really fits with us men because, you know, we buy a bicycle for the children on Christmas. And you've all done it, so everybody be honest now. We've all done this. You break out the, the, the bicycle and all the parts that go with it. And you know all about bicycles because you always had one and you fixed them before and everything. So you decide you're going to put this bicycle together by yourself without reading the book. And you're not going to take one glance at the book. You're just going to put it together. Well, you get about halfway into that thing, and then you're going to have to break the book out. Because when all else fails, read the instruction book, as the saying goes. And so many times we don't realize the importance of reading this instruction book before we try to live our lives. And so let's put the heart, the old saying goes, the horse before the cart, you know. And so... Uh, you don't so you don't go try to live your life without the word of God because that's putting the cart first and the horse is behind it and the horse ain't going to push the cart he's only going to be able to pull it 
So you put the word of God, the horse, in front and let him pull the cart, which is you, through life. And that's the way which is supposed to work. And in former years, believe it or not, they actually had really good understanding of this. But in our modern society, it's been lost. And the modern people don't want instructions. That's the last thing we want. We don't want any instructions. We want to do everything our way. And if it works out, fine. If it don't work out, fine. But we, we just don't want nobody to tell us nothing. Well, that's the height of pride, you know. And, and it'll always come back to haunt you. It'll never work that way. It'll always catch up. And you can't outrun it. And you can't hide from it. Because we can't live without instruction. The life is too complicated. So let's look then at some of the passages that entail revealed knowledge. Romans chapter 1 verse 17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. The, the fact that God is right, and it's revealed in the gospel, by the way. That's the previous verse. He's talking about that he speaks of the gospel. And then he says, For therein, for the word of God and the gospel message, is right, the righteousness of God revealed. So it's revealed by the message of the gospel, how right God is, you know. And the thing that we have to apply ourselves to is, is not waiting till we're old, until we fall in the pit a few times and stumble a few times and bruise our knees and hurt our heart and break our hearts and, and lose our homes or our marriages or, or alienate the children or, or see heartache and misery or a despair, you know, and go through terrible things before we wake up and realize it. But if we get into the gospel, we can see that the righteousness, the fact that God is actually right and the world around you is wrong, that the righteousness, the rightness of God, you might say, is revealed from faith to faith. So you start out with a basic faith accepting Christ, and then you go one step deeper in faith, and one step deeper, and from it's it's like a it's like a level from from one level. You know, per, perhaps Lucas would uh, go along with me on this. It's, you know, a video game. You go, you have to, you can't start off at level level five. You have to start out at level one. And you have to beat that level and go to level two, and then you beat that level and go to level three. Okay, so from faith to faith, from level to level, like that. You see, and it gets stronger and stronger and more clear and clear as you go from faith to faith. From one level of faith to the next level of faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And the just is a, a shortened, uh, word, shortened word for justified, which means that you've accepted Christ and his blood has forgiven you of your sins. And that you've renounced the world, the flesh, and the devil. And you've accepted Christ to be your Lord and Savior and your Master. And then his resurrection justified you, made qualified you, and opened a door for your spirit man to be alive unto God. But it's this righteousness of God that is revealed, and it's revealed through the knowledge of God. Let's look at our next passage, and it is the negative side of this. You know, there's a flip side of the coin. And where there's uh, great promises and everything, then there is also warnings to God's people about their perception of reality and how they're living and how well they're living, the Word of God. And here is one of them, and it's the flip side of that coin. And it is uh, Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. He says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And that's the knowledge of God. That's not, you know, a, a, a academic knowledge, you know, or scientific knowledge or anything like that. It's not worldly knowledge. It's knowledge of the Word of God. And here he says that they are destroyed because they don't have it. And then he, then he, this is a stern warning to the people of Israel and the people of God in general. He says, because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. So we can't reject the knowledge of God. 
or he might reject us. That thou may be no priest unto me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. So, in other words, God is warning us that if you press your luck with him and you don't want his knowledge, and you walk away from him, that he might reject you and not show up and ask you to be his friend anymore. And that he won't bless your children. So it's a stern warning to people, you see. And so we can't then play around with our lives like people think, you know. And we mentioned it, I think, a couple of days ago. Today's world says, oh, it's party time, man. What's wrong with you? It's time to go. Let's go get a uh, alcohol drink and let's go, you know, do this and that, you know. And the girls are down there and let's uh, eat, uh, drink, and marry for tomorrow. We die. You know, just live any old kind of way. It don't matter. Who who cares? There ain't no God. There ain't no word. There ain't no principles. There ain't no culture. There ain't no truth. Just live any way. You'll be all right. No, that's not true. That'd take you to hell. And that's what the devil's trying to do. That's what the world's trying to do. It, it wants to drag you down and hold you back and pull you. And even the things that you've accomplished that are good, he's trying to take it away right out from under you when you ain't looking. He, he's trying to just, you know, the devil don't stand up in front of you and, and put up a big poster sign and say, okay, destruction is ahead. I'm going to throw you under the bus and run over you a couple of times and I'm going to back up a few more times and run over you and I'm going to take away all the beautiful things you like and care about and I'm going to live, give you a life of misery and I'm going to get you down on skid row and I'm going to drag you through the mud and, and treat you like dirt and then later on you're going to burn in hell with me forever. No, he doesn't put that sign out. He doesn't put that out at all. He puts out this big, beautiful neon sign that's all flashy and glamorous, and it says girls, and, and it has all kinds of uh, happy hours free, and, and it looks beautiful on the outside. And you go in there, and, and, and it's cool, and the music's great, and the, the people are fun and exciting, and, and uh, it's all happy, and the drinks are wonderful, or you think so. And then... You know, you don't realize it, but spiritually you've walked into the darkness of the devil. And he'll use that to, to work through your lives to destroy you, make you an alcoholic, and ruin your life. And drag all the precious things that God's trying to give you away from you. Because he's the devil. And he may, he's, a, he's a beautiful illusionist. I mean, well, I can't say he's beautiful, but he, he's definitely brilliant at his illusions. He will give you the illusion that you can live anyway and everything will be all right. And simply put, that is a lie. That is not true. There is results to rejecting the wisdom and knowledge of God. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 13 is our verse for this. It says, Therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. And their honorable men are famished. So there are honorable people that should be standing up and proclaiming these things far greater than myself. You know, that, that men of great power and wealth and uh, position and authority and perhaps only multiple uh, corporations and being on uh, uh, numerous boards of, of charitable organizations and all kinds of great things, great men, honorable men. Here it says that these honorable men are famished. In other words, they're hungry. And famished is, is starvation. And that he, do, he doesn't mean food, like natural food. He means they're, they're spiritually famished. They hadn't been fed spiritually. So their, their honorable men are famished. And their multitude, so multitude would be their citizenry in today's world. Their, their community, their state, or their nation. Their multitude is dried up with thirst. Here they they you know they've uh, dried up like a, a raisin. They you know they they're thirsty, and Jesus is the Word of God is the living water. So so in both cases he's the manna he, he's the bread of life, and that's for the honorable men that should be eating him the Word of God, and so. Um, they should be in, taking in the word of God, and they're not. They're but they're famished, so you can't put no confidence in that. 
then the multitude of people around you are thirsting to death because they won't drink no water. And you can't put no confidence in that. So then it's the people of God then that gets drug into captivity. People God cares about. And why? Because their honorable men ain't doing right and their, their citizenry ain't doing right. And no one told them that they need the knowledge of God to stay out of captivity. But we're saying that today. It's the revealed knowledge that will keep you from captivity. And it doesn't have to be bars, and it doesn't have to be chains, and it doesn't have to be a foreign army that comes and grabs you and takes you away into slavery or something like that. You know, you can be enslaved to um, drugs, to alcohol, to depression, to heartache, to disappointment, to to um, setbacks, to poverty, to um, uh, just all types of uh, evils, you know, depression and and uh, grief and sorrow and you know you can be hurt multiple ways and led into captivity multiple different ways and the devil's got a way for every one of us to get off into some type and form of captivity captivity whether it be spiritually or physically or both you know he, he would love to drag you down because mainly because you see he's not the friend of Jesus we could pretty much say that for sure I'm not trying to be too sarcastic anyway but I can pretty much promise you that Jesus is not too friendly with the devil and so the devil don't like Jesus the devil's out to hurt Jesus the devil hates Jesus and so you are made in the image of God and one of the reasons why he hates you so much is because Jesus um, the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit decided as God that you was going to be have more authority and ability than the angels themselves. They were going to put angels under man's spiritual authority. That's number one. That really made the devil mad because he's an archangel that fought, got kicked out of heaven. Then he made man in his own image so we look like God. And the devil, you know, he's all dried up and ugly looking and he's, you know, got all the appearance of a, a terrible demonic force and E.T. of the worst sort, you know. And he's ugly and reptilian and, and you know, he's cold-blooded and, and he's heartless and gutless and, and hateful and mean and spiteful and bitter and angry and raged. And so he's a horrible being, you know. And then he looks at you and you're a nice, kind person, you know, and you do any things for people and you want to talk to people and you want to be friends with people and you're in the image of God and, and you've got more power than his angels does. And so he don't like you too much. But he don't like me either. So don't be discouraged. But he's out to take away the dreams and the hopes and lead mankind into captivity. Because he, see, when he hurts you, he's hurting a child of God. And that hurts God because God loves you. So if he, see, he gets you to trip up, then you're, God, Jesus has got a tear on his eye because that's my boy down there doing that. Or that's my girl down there doing that. You know, And he's got a tear in his eye about it because the devil's led him off into captivity somehow. And the devil can't do it without you surrendering to him, to his ideas and things he tries to throw at you, you know. Or if he can get you to hate yourself or look down yourself or act in an undignified way or forget that you're an ambassador of God and that you're a priest and that you're a king unto God and that he's given you kingship over your life and that you are a creator because you can create your future by going to school and things like this not throwing anything at Brother Lucas but you know we can go to school and learn a course in something or another and then we get a certificate and we can go get a job with that and we have created something we have created something and then you get married and you, you and your wife um, in holy matrimony have relations that are proper in adult we can't talk about too much but then there's a child born and you created a child see he's given you the power to procreate your children and then your future you know and we talked the other day about how important it is what kind of seeds we're sowing because 
if you take an apple seed and you put that apple seed in the ground, it will produce an apple tree. And that apple tree will have many apples on it, and one of them will fall off and hit the ground, and it'll produce another apple tree. And if you leave it alone for a few years, you'll have a whole orchard of apple trees. So this one seed had the potential to create a whole orchard of apple trees and thousands upon thousands of apples. You see, you planted an apple seed and you got a harvest of apples. And then that works with all things in, in the world, in our lives. He said, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall remain. So then we have to look at what kind of seeds we're planting. Because if you're planting love and kindness and goodness and mercy and tenderness and help and assistance and blessings and, and kindness and all these wonderful things that the Bible tells you to plant, then you're going to get a wonderful harvest off that. It'll come in in a bumper crop. People will be good to you and bless you everywhere you turn. But on the other hand, it works in the negative as well. If you plant hate and meanness and spite and bitterness and jealousy and rage and anger and drugs and alcohol and, and uh, uh, all kinds of things down the line like this, then you're going to reap a harvest of that. But we have to be cautious then because what we're sowing is what we're reaping, good or bad, right or wrong, blessing or cursing. And so we want to plant the right kind of crop if we're going to have the right kind of life. And these are just a few of the things that the knowledge of God will teach us. And we have many to learn. Let's look at another one right quick. It's uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse uh, 2 to 3. And if anybody knows how long we have been talking, please let me know because I've lost track of the time. I do that quite often. I get focused on the study and, and I'm going to have to give me a big clock or something. <laughs> so I apologize to you. I don't know how long we've been talking. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 2 and 3 says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you. So here we have two things. The grace of God in your life. Grace. And let's define grace for a minute. Grace, is first of all, is unmerited favor. And what that means is, is that by, that is the most best basic explanation of what the word grace means is unmerited favor and what it means is is that we don't deserve it we hadn't done anything to want it we hadn't done anything to earn it it's just God's love for you it's unmerited favor and then grace is also an adjective in the fact that that grace will give something to you that you need and that's favor with God and favor with man. It will put favor on your finances and favor on your, your friendships, favor on your sweethearts and favor on your marriages and favor on your uh, home and favor in your children. You see, it's grace. It's God's goodness just being poured out. It's his unmerited favor being poured out. And here he says that this grace and peace, now we mentioned this the other day, that peace is not something you can go down to the gas station and buy. It's not on the store shelf. It's not at the supermarket. It's not at the super center. You can't order it out of a order magazine or get it, get it buy it online with some PayPal or something. You can't get that grace or peace just by ordering it because there ain't no peace on earth. The only place there is peace is in heaven. Peace with God. Peace from God. And you have to import it. And it comes from God. Through your relationship with Christ. And here he says that this grace and this peace that comes from God and God alone can be multiplied. We know what multiplied means. Two times two is four. Multiplied unto you. And how do you do that? Through the knowledge of God, through knowing God, through knowing the Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. We get that from John 1.1 1, 1 that says, In the beginning was the Word, capital W, denotes deity. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning. All things were created by Him. Without Him, nothing was created that was created. 
So he made everything. He's the creator. He's the word. He's God. 114, and the word, capital W, became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld the glory like unto the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's Jesus, the Word of God, the Creator. And He's the Word of God in this Bible. This King James Bible is a representation on earth of the knowledge that of the Word of God that is given to us. So what does that mean? If you know your Bible, you know Jesus. And as much as you know the Bible... As much as you know about the nature and love and kindness and goodness and the person of Jesus. Knowing the Bible is knowing Jesus. It's that simple. Jesus is the Word. And here we have the Word of God in physical form. An earthly presentation of the Son of God for our lives. And he says that through this knowledge of, this, of God, Jesus being God, um, well, God, the Father being God and of Jesus our Lord. See, and, and that knowledge is in this book. It's the word of truth. It's the bread of life. It's the living water. And so this revealed knowledge then becomes very, very important. And he says the next verse, according to his divine power hath he given unto us all things. So he's got some provisions for you. You know, if we was going on a camping trip, we would have to stop at the store, and we'd have to pick up some sardines and some fire logs and some uh, ice and some drinks of Coke or Pepsi or whatever, and uh, some uh, maybe some uh, charcoal and some hamburger meat and some hot dog material and hamburger stuff and and uh, everything we would need, and we would be getting our provisions for our camping trip. And, uh, and so it's a wonderful thing, and we would pick up the uh, supplies, and we would be ready to go, right? That would be provisions, and it's a, that's the way it works, you know? And so God is our provision right here, and he has given us the provisions we need. According to his power, he's given us all provisions that pertain everything you need that pertain unto life everlasting life eternal life and God likeness godliness and how does we get that through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and to virtue glory be to God and this is the task then, is to come to this revealed knowledge so that we can have life and godliness, grace and peace and glory and virtue. These are the benefits of knowing the revealed knowledge of God. And so in our time today, I'd like to ask you, then to take the Bible very serious. It's the basic instructions before living earth. So let's get to know Jesus. And I want to remind you that Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's a real friend. And he won't use you. He won't take advantage of you. He won't talk behind your back. He won't stab you in the back. He won't forsake you during hard times. Matter of fact, he'll be that much more closer during hard times. And he's a good God. And he gave his life so that you didn't go into captivity for lack of knowledge of his holy word. So let's serve Jesus. Let's be a friend back. Let's be a real friend. Let's show ourselves to be friendly. And let's get to know our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, let's use the revealed knowledge of God to get close to him and to be in his presence and to be in the of grace, expecting to receive mercy and grace to help in a time of need. And so this is the task of the believer today. And let us not fail him. Let us take this revealed knowledge 
and make it have new impotence in our life, new importance, new strength for today, the times we live. And let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for your promises and your word. I thank you for your son, Jesus, and I thank you for your revealed knowledge. And I thank you for pouring out your spirit. And I, it's my prayer, Lord God, that you would open the eyes of our understanding, that we might know what the height and the depth and the love wherewith you have called us, and, and that you would grant unto us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him, and that you would make us good disciples and scholars of your holy word. And that this revealed knowledge would lead us forward in a way that's everlasting. And I pray you'll bless this study and replay to many people in their social media networks and emails and things. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Bless Lucas and Karen and J.D. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, thank you for being with us today. I hope you've enjoyed our study of the friendship of God and the revealed knowledge that he's given us to get to know him as our friend. And I trust it touched your heart and that you'll be interested in knowing more about our Savior and God by reading his holy word. And so on behalf of Brother Lucas and Sister Karen and Brother J.D., it is my prayer that uh, you would uh, go with God and that you would be strengthened in, in your inner man with the understanding of God's word and that you would be raised up to great heights and he would build you up and make you into a great person for God, man or woman, of your family and all that you would do in life. Because as you honor him, he says, I will honor them that honors me. So let's honor him by knowing his revealed knowledge, the King James Bible. And that's our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen.